Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in a two-part series on species at risk snake habitat on farms. So both webinars are designed to help create help farmers have a positive impact on snake habitat. We will be outlining the new best available practices for helping snakes on your property. These practices are outlined in the provincial document, Best Management Practices for Identifying, Managing, and Creating Habitat for Species at Risk Snakes. This is a new document that was developed by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in 2018. So these two webinars are not meant to replace the document, but instead we, we hope to make it more digestible to those without biological backgrounds. We also hope this presentation will help you to navigate to the correct section of the best management practices if you require it. But most importantly, we hope to inspire you to protect, create, or restore snake habitat on your property. The first webinar focused on how to identify species at risk snake habitat and how to avoid or minimize impacting this habitat while you farm. So in case you missed it, we will provide a very high level summary of that content today. Um, but both webinars will be posted on the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association website um, in case, case you missed either one. Today's webinar will go over how to create, restore, and monitor species at risk snake habitat. And the presentation will be approximately 50 to 55 minutes long. This webinar is provided through the Species at Risk Farm Incentive Program, which is delivered by the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. This program provides cost share opportunities for Ontario farmers to implement best management practices on their farms in order to protect species at risk. And the program is funded by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Blazing Star Environmental was hired as the species experts um, and we developed and to develop and present this material. Uh, Blazing Star Environmental is also the lead author of the best management practices document that we will be talking about over the next hour. And just a little bit more about Blazing Star Environmental. Uh, we are an ecological consulting company that was founded in January 2015. And we work on a variety of conservation projects for a variety of clients from governments to not-for-profits to land trusts to private landowners to name a few. Uh, we specialize in land conservation, species and ecosystem management, and we also do some scientific research and monitoring projects. Uh, and if you know us, you know that most of our work relates to reptile and amphibian conservation. And Michelle Hill is the owner, and sorry, my name is Moni Gartz. I am the conservation biologist at Blazing Star Environmental. Uh, and Michelle Hill, owner of Totally Restored, uh, will be presenting a lot of this webinar today. And here she is. Awesome, thanks Mo. No problem. All right, so um, just as I go along in this, I, and hello everyone, hope you're doing well today. Um, I will note that um, along the bottom green um, is where if you need any more information, there will be references there on the bottom of each slide. Okay, so the purpose of this document is to assist with the protection and recovery of Ontario's species at risk snakes. It provides necessary information for individuals undertaking activities within or adjacent to snake star habitat to be able to comply with the Endangered Species Act. It is based on the best available information, although there is still a lack of information on the effectiveness of recommended approaches. This document should be applied in an, in an experimental framework uh, which is essential to improve our understanding of snake habitat creation and management techniques. This best management practices document will be updated to reflect new information as our understanding changes. So as Monique mentioned, sections one through three and half of four were covered on Tuesday. Uh, key points from that presentation will be highlighted in the next few slides and then we will proceed to how to minimize adverse effects in sections five and six. One way that snakes are beneficial to your farm is through their diet. Snakes control pest populations by preying on rodents, insects, and slugs, reducing damage to crops, and preventing disease from spreading. 
Snakes are both a predator and prey in the food web, an important component in maintaining the balance of a healthy functioning ecosystem. And we also have provincial, national, and international commitment to protect the biodiversity. There are several threats to Ontario snakes, such as habitat loss and fragmentation. This is the one threat that all species at risk snake species have in common. Transforming the natural environment to human land uses has negatively affected snake populations in Ontario. Constant development pressure will only continue to limit ranges of the species at risk snakes. If there has ever been a need for creating and restoring snake habitat, it is now. Snakes are illegally sold and bought in the pet trade, and although it is illegal to kill snakes, uninformed people often kill snakes because of their large size, fear, and misconceptions. Phagmites is an invasive species that eliminates shallow water habitat when it forms dense stands, and it spreads very easily between sites on vehicles and footwear. Snake fungal disease has had negative effects on snake populations. And lastly, road mortality. Snakes are very difficult to see on the road, and some drivers intentionally hit snakes. When snakes travel two to three kilometers for different habitat uses, there are so many roads they have to cross to survive. Although the following recommendations should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, the following are generally effective methods for avoiding adverse effects to SAR snake habitat. The best way to avoid adverse effects to species at risk snakes is to relocate the project to an area where they will not be affected. If working in an area that has SAR snakes, identify areas unlikely to provide suitable SAR snake habitat and limit potentially damaging activities to these areas. For example, carrying out your project on a cash crop field or old parking lot is unlikely to affect SAR snakes in the area. However, it's important to consider indirect effects as well. For example, building a structure next to snake thermoregulation sites would impede the functionality of the habitat by shading it even if the footprint of the structure is not actually located in the habitat. Consider the sensitivity of the habitat that you would like to work in. Remember the three categories and carry out any projects in, that, in areas that are least sensitive to alteration. For example, activities that may affect important gestation habitat would not equally affect movement habitat. If a project only has short-term effects, then it should be conducted during time of year that would not affect the habitat when it is being used. For example, carry out activities that could affect the water table of a hibernaculum during the summer when the snakes aren't hibernating. It's acceptable as long as the water table is returned to pre-project condition by the time the snakes are ready to overwinter. There are 15 extant snake species native to Ontario. One species, the timber rattlesnake, has been extirpated from Ontario. Nine snake species and subspecies are listed as endangered, threatened, or special concern on the species at risk in Ontario list. So a species at risk is a plant or animal that is in danger of disappearing from the wild. The monarch butterfly is an example of a species of concern. This is a species that may become threatened or endangered because of a combination of biological characteristics and identified threats. A threatened species such as the barn swallow, is a species that is likely to become endangered if nothing is done to reverse the factors leading to its extirpation or extinction. The little brown bat, an endangered species, is one that is facing imminent extirpation or extinction. And an extirpated species, such as the eastern box turtle, is a species that no longer exists in the wild from in Canada, but is still living in other areas of the world. And just to go over, um, are nine snake species. Uh, the eastern ribbon snake is listed as special concern. The eastern hog nose snake is threatened. The eastern fox snake is endangered and threatened in the Georgian Bay population. The Massasauga rattlesnake is endangered in the Carolinian population and threatened in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence population. The queen snake and the butler snake are endangered. The gray rat snake is endangered in the Carolinian population and threatened in the Frontenac access population and the Lake Erie water snake is special concern, and the blue racer is listed as endangered. In some special cases, it may not be possible to avoid all adverse effects to SAR snake habitat. However, there are steps you can take to minimize these effects significantly. When SAR snake habitat cannot be avoided altogether, it is important to plan the project footprint so there is as little overlap as possible with SAR snake habitat. Some recommendations for achieving this are to keep the project footprint as small as possible, build up rather than out, try to keep as much of the project footprint 
footprint as possible outside of star snake habitat, maximize use of natural features and the ecosystem services that they provide instead of creating artificial alternatives. For example, in the case of stormwater management, wetlands should be maintained instead of constructing artificial holding ponds. Prioritize preservation of sensitive habitat and their key features, minimize habitat fragmentation, maintain functionality in damaged habitats, and we will go into more detail on the last three points in the next few slides. It's important to preserve sensitive habitats and key habitat features that star snakes depend on. Hibernacula, where snakes overwinter in particular, as snakes are highly dependent on them and difficult to re recreate. Hibernacula should be identified during surveys and steps should be taken to avoid damaging or destroying them. Gestation and nesting sites should also be preserved. Although it's easier to recreate than hibernacula, snakes revisit and use them the same sites every year, so the loss of them could impact an entire population. Thermal regulation or basking habitat and movement habitat are more abundant on the landscape. So if these habitats are lost, SAR snakes will be able to find similarly functioning habitat within their home range. Damaging or destroying important habitat to the point where it can no longer facilitate movement can cause habitat fragmentation. Habitat fragmentation can occur at small scales within a snake's home range if barriers are present that prevent it from accessing important habitats. It's important to not only maintain critical habitat, but also to ensure that these habitats are adjacent to each other and freely accessible through movement corridors. Some recommendations for maintaining habitat connectivity are consider the entire landscape, Limit projects to edge of important habitats to minimize fragmentation and remove smaller patches of habitat. This will still maintain movement in remaining patches. Maintain or create as much thermal regulation, foraging and movement habitat as possible to avoid creating isolated patches of habitat. If activities are likely to fragment habitat, create movement corridors, maximum width of 25 meters where possible. And it's especially important to ensure that hibernacula are not isolated. Maintain any natural drainage systems that facilitate star snake movement, such as ditches and their associated riparian zones. If the landscape is highly developed, maintain or create linear features that can facilitate movement, such as hedgerows. We want to avoid creating any habitat near roads, as this can result in road mortality. Avoid creating any barriers, such as solid fencing and retaining walls that would prevent snakes from moving through habitats. If these features are necessary, please modify them to allow snake movement. For example, create passageways for snakes along the bottom of the structure or build a fence that's 30 centimeters off the ground. Also want to avoid creating small habitat patches, uh, less than 10 hectares in size, as snake abundance and diversity is greater in larger habitats. If activities damage but do not completely destroy star snake habitat, it may be possible to preserve some of the habitat's functionality depending on the magnitude and scope of the activity. Even if the original function of the habitat is lost, it may be possible for the habitat to serve an alternative purpose. For example, areas that previously served as thermal regulation and foraging habitat for star snakes may still provide movement habitat if it's managed properly. And pictured here is a savanna habitat that provides important thermal regulation and foraging habitat for species like the blue racer and the eastern fox snake. Although creation, restoration, and maintenance is occurring, there is not much information on the effectiveness or long-term implications for local populations. This lack of knowledge makes it difficult to replace habitats, so maintaining naturally occurring habitat is prioritized. When you're choosing a habitat to create on your property, you can ask questions such as, what species at risk snakes are present or known to be in the area? Do they have any specific requirements? What habitat is lacking and what is feasible? So in general on your farm or in, for the species in particular, you can look at what habitat is lacking. Uh, it is ideal that an initial survey be conducted by experts on the property for all habitat types to assess which are or are not present. Habitat types to survey include hibernation locations, basking rocks, edge habitat, which are the spaces that provide cover or an edge, microhabitat, which is a place with a bit more complexity, and you probably have the open field part uh, covered. 
The next is to think what is feasible, what is possible to do on your property with the, your available resources. The water table is an important part of hibernation and habitat feasibility. I will discuss the lifestone in the coming slides that requires the water table to be close to the surface on parts of the property. If the entire property is cash crops on your, or forest, then there is likely not much space for any hibernation habitat. You may already have the materials on your property that can be used for snake habitat that may otherwise cost money to dispose of. For example, extra concrete materials in the barn can be placed along the edge of your farm in a sunlit area near vegetation, uh, and this creates basking sites. Some materials may be toxic to snakes or the critters that snakes eat, so be sure to check the materials before your habitat is created. Um, this may include pressure treated woods or anything else with potential chemicals. That being said, most rock and wood substrates uh, should be fine to use. So snakes spend the winter in underground retreats known as hibernacula, singular as hibernaculum, that allow them to get below the frost line and avoid freezing. Snakes generally require access to the water table to avoid drying out during hibernation. There's a variety of habitat features that can provide suitable hibernation habitat for snakes, including fissures and crevices in rock, animal burrows, underground spaces associated with large tree roots and stumps and foundations, for example, barn foundations, uh, culvert embankments, and old cobble lined wells and cisterns. Hibernation periods vary among species and within snake species at different latitudes. This hibernation begins in September, October, or early November, and it'll extend until April or early May, again, depending on the species, seasonal weather variation, and latitude. Choose an appropriate location with occupied habitat where there is adequate sun exposure, sufficient basking and retreat sites, and a suitable life zone. So this picture, figure depicts a life zone model, which is a hypothetical subterranean feature that has a suitable life zone for snake hibernation between the frost line and the water table. The size of the life zone can vary significantly across the landscape based on many factors, such as topography, soil type, drainage, vegetation, cover, etc. Snake hibernacula often have southern exposure, which allows greater basking opportunities in the spring and the fall. This needs to be in an area that is sheltered from the wind and allows a deeper snowpack to insulate it from extreme temperature fluctuations in the winter and the spring. Due to the very specific microhabitat conditions, hibernation habitat is often limiting on the landscape. Because of this, snakes often demonstrate high fidelity. They have a strong preference and loyalty to the hibernation sites and these habitats are often used communally. To determine the maximum depth of the frost line, insert a frost tube two to three meters into the ground. You want to monitor for multiple years until an exceptionally cold, i.e. colder than average, winter is experienced. To find the water table, begin by digging or drilling pilot holes and measuring the depth at which water enters the holes during the winter. Water tables can fluctuate significantly, sometimes by several meters, among and between years. It is necessary to monitor water table levels for over multiple years prior to constructing hibernaculum. The water table should reach the lower depths of the hibernaculum because snakes generally require access to the water table to avoid dehydration during hibernation. Although some water within the hibernaculum appears to be eventual, beneficial, rapid flooding of hibernacula can cause significant mortality. When data on the depth of and fluctuations of the water table are not available, construction should occur in late fall or early winter so that the height of the water, winter water table can be assessed. Create the hibernaculum in an area where there will always be a suitable life zone between the frost line and the water table, taking into account annual variation in frost line and water depth. Choose sites with well-drained soils to reduce the risk of flooding in the hibernaculum. Avoid construction constructing hibernacula in areas with drainage tile because they can become blocked and result in flooding. Select a south facing site that receives sunlight for the majority of the day during the spring and is protected from the wind. Hibernaculum can also be created in deciduous forests because of the time of year that snakes enter and emerge from hibernacula, there are no leaves on the trees to block the sunlight. Ensure that suitable basking sites are available or constructed within 100 meters of each hibernaculum. Locate the hibernaculum within suitable habitat that is occupied by target species and select a site that is distant as possible from known threats, such as roads, active industrial or agri agricultural activities, 
urban areas, and areas of intensive recreational activity. So the first stage in creating hibernacula is excavation and getting your dimensions. You want to excavate a large pit at the chosen location in a bowl shape with gradually tapered sides. And this is an overflow drainage spillway during mid-construction uh, built to mitigate potential rapid flooding of the constructed hibernaculum. The spillway is built above the grade level of the deepest part of the excavated bowl to allow some water to remain in the hibernaculum. Field stone surrounds a big O pipe and will be covered with additional fill. Install drainage features if there is the potential for rapid flooding at the site. The next step is laying the groundwork. So you want to line the base of the pit with gravel or a sand gravel mix. This layer can improve drainage and humidity. And position one segment of the big O plastic piping such that one end is at the bottom of the pit and the other extends up the side of the pit to the top. Repeat with at least two more segments of the plastic piping. Um, drill holes into the piping varying in orientation. These openings facilitate snake movements within the hibernaculum to, and promote the mixing of air which moderates temperature gradients. Position the plastic piping so that there is at least one gentle up bend in the pipe before it descends fully to the bottom of the excavation. This bend in the pipe creates a simple trap for cold airflow. Do not drill holes into the trap section of the pipe. This bend, the perforations in the big O pipe, and the partially covered surface opening helps prevent freezing temperatures from reaching the innermost chambers of the hibernaculum. The next stage is creating underground chambers. So place a regularly shaped concrete blocks, concrete slabs, rock, and even small amount of wooden material into the excavation. Use concrete blocks to create chambers near the bottom of the hibernaculum and to keep concrete slabs from lying flat against the bottom or one another. Position materials carefully to create interconnected passageways and deep chambers through which snakes can move vertically and laterally. An excavator bucket with a thumb has more control in placing materials within the hibernaculum. Some woody material, like roots and stumps, should be included in the hibernaculum construction, but their quantity should be limited to guard against excessive settling and decay over time. Logs can be placed towards the surface of the hibernaculum during construction, but should not be placed too deep as they could co cause collapse of the structure as they decompose. And the last stage is completing the surface of the hibernaculum. After covering the hibernaculum with landscape fabric, create a low mound with rocks, logs, and topsoil to provide additional insulation and so that settling does not result in a depression over time. Although the completed hibernaculum need not protrude much above the natural grade. Mounding above grade is not a suitable alternative to digging deep enough to establish an appropriate life zone. Fieldstone, brush, and stumps are piled near the surface, provide hiding and basking sites for snakes and potential access points into the hibernaculum through interconnected underground passageways. As construction nears completion, ensure that a sufficient number of passageways reach the surface to allow snakes entry and exit, but not so many that cold air descends easily in the innermost, innermost chambers. Brush and field stone cover the entrances to the pipes at the surface. The interconnected spaces between the rocks and other material provided cover entry and exit points for snakes from predators and insulation. To finish, final grading away from the openings ensures that surface drainage will not lead to potential flooding of the hibernaculum. Once the snakes have come out of hibernation, they move into what we call active season habitat, which describes the habitat that they use throughout the year. Microhabitat are specialized habitats like nesting and gestation, which I will talk about on my next slides. All of these microhabitats share some common features. So generally, if there's a field with sparse vegetation and no rocks or logs, snakes will likely benefit from more structure, especially near the sun exposed edges of the field such as a rock pile here on the edge. Place structures in areas with suitable habitat and that are known to be occupied by the target species. Open sun exposed areas for at least most of the day in the structure should be placed sloping towards the sun or on flat even ground. It should be placed near an edge or structure, even tall grasses, that allows snakes to get to the created habitat without being seen by a predator, for example, a hawk. It can be near pooling or standing water, but not in it and away from potential hazards like roads, laneways, predator corridors, flooding, and vandals. 
the eastern fox snake, uh, the gray rat snake, the blue racer, and the eastern hognose snake are examples of oviparous or egg-laying snakes. They prefer open habitat that receives sun for most of the day and high nest temperature that result in shorter incubation periods for snakes, which means hatchling survivorship because of the more forage time before hibernation. Natural nest sites look like piles of vegetation and mammal burrows, anthropogenic features such as compost or brush piles. The target species for next boxes and cages are the eastern fox snake, the gray rat snake, and the blue racer. Limited data on the use and effectiveness. Um, there is some documented, documented success with eastern fox snake and gray rat snakes, but additional research is required to assess the use and success. A nest box, which is pictured on the left, is a cubic wooden frame with mesh fencing to keep out egg predators. Um, you want to assemble the wood frame and brace the corners, attach wire fencing, ensure no gaps are large enough for a predator to get in, such as a raccoon. You want to assemble two more squares for the remo removable front and top. Anchor the nest box to the ground using T-bars or stakes so it is not prone to being tipped over. And this is a photo of a fully assembled nest box. It is more than 75% full of nesting material and located in a sunny location in appropriate snake habitat. Next on the right is a nest cage. Uh, to create this, shape a long piece of fencing into a cylinder with ends overlapping by at least two lengths. Fasten the length of the two ends and the cage fencing together with zip ties. At the desired location, pound the T-bar fence posts into the ground and place cover over the posts and fill it with nesting material. Then place fencing on the top of the cage and fasten it with zip ties, again ensuring there are no gaps for predators. And this is a photo of a nest cage created for eastern fox snakes with the lid attached. The site location and nesting material are the same for both nest boxes and cages, but construction methods and materials differ. It should be built in early spring and it does require annual maintenance. It can be placed near compost or wood chip piles if they're in appropriate habitat and receive adequate sunlight. For the nest material, use equal parts mulch or peat moss, straw and dry leaves. Include shed snake skins and eggshells from previous years to help attract the snakes. And just a note that nesting habitat for the eastern fog hognose snake is largely experimental and should be part of a hypothesis driven experimental research study. Gestation is the period of time where the embryo is growing and developing in the snake's womb. Ovoviviparous snakes include the butler's garter snake, eastern ribbon snake, Lake Erie water snake, Massasauga, and queen snake. And with these snakes, the eggs hatch within the females and then they give birth to live young. Pregnant females use specialized habitats known as gestation sites. They typically occur in habitat that lack or have very limited canopy cover and receive high sun exposure. It allows them to maintain consistently high body temperatures to promote the development of live young. Pregnant females move to gestation sites shortly after emerging from hibernation, remaining at these sites until giving birth in the late summer. They prefer microhabitats that will allow for thermoregulation and shelter from predation, such as animal burrows, brush piles, low-lying vegetation, and anthropogenic features such as boards and scrap metal. Like hibernation and nesting sites, gestation and live bearing sites have very specific microhabitat characteristics and may be limited on the landscape. Individuals demonstrate high fidelity to these sites, which are often used communally by multiple individuals. Characteristics of gestation sites vary among species depending on species specific habitat preferences. With the exception of the Massasauga, there has been little research to the creation of gestation sites or Ontario species at risk snakes. Since gestation sites are essential basking sites that are used for specialized function, the creation of high quality basking sites will typically provide suitable gestation habitat for most species. Areas that receive sunlight for more than half of the day uh, to give consistently high body temperature to promote the development of the young. And put them in, near, um, they like it near areas that provide shelter from extreme temperatures and predators. Follow the guidance for creating basking sites, which I will be talking about in the next slide. Most Ontario species at risk snakes give birth at or near gestation sites. The same habitat features are used by gestating females and newborn snakes. To create birthing habitat for all Ontario species at risk snakes, except for Bartler's garter snake, follow the guidance for creating basking sites. 
for Butler's Garda Snake, follow Basking Site Creation, and see additional methodology for the Queen Snake in section 5.3. Snakes are ectothermic and their body temperature fluctuates with the ambient environment. Therefore, snakes alter their behavior and habitat use to regulate body temperature. Snakes increase their body temperature by basking in sunny areas. They do not require large open habitats for basking. Typically, they are near retreat sites which are microhabitat features that provide shelter from extreme temperatures and protection from predation. This is where they can sun themselves and heat up, and if a predator were to come by, they can retreat into the forest or hedgerow for cover, such as rock piles along field edges. Um, these are also great for snakes. These rocks are picked up from the field so that farm equipment doesn't get damaged, and the rocks can be placed along the edge of the field. Other structures include forest areas, forest edge, fields, meadows, retaining walls, barns, wood piles, cement slabs, plywood, and other forms of debris. Basking sites provide protection from predators as well as a range of thermal conditions that facilitate thermal regulation and shedding. Placement is extremely important and it's important to lo locate in open habitats that receive sunlight for the majority of the day. Uh, brush pile, uh, basking site designs include brush piles. If constructed correctly, should be suitable as basking sites for all Ontario species at risk snakes. And as you can see here, there's a photo of a butler's garter snake basking on a created brush pile. Rocker cement slabs, if constructed correctly, should be suitable as basking sites for all Ontario species at risk snakes. Uh, you want to elevate these five to seven centimeters off the ground using brick or cement supports. Alternatively, elevate one side only. Use additional bricks or rocks or cement to lift the number Oh, to limit the number and size of openings under the slab to reduce openness and limit access by predators. Gavion baskets are wire mesh filled with large rocks that are typically constructed for erosion control purposes, but can also be used to create snake habitat. Relatively resistant to vandalism, um, the, the wire exterior may reduce some forms of snake predation and provide a secure location for snake shedding. It is unknown whether they will function for many of Ontario's species or snakes, so should be constructed with other basking sites as part of an experimental study, and their use should be carefully monitored and reported. And as you can see here, there's an eastern garter snake basking on this gabion basket. Rock piles, if constructed correctly, should be suitable as basking sites for all of Ontario's species at risk snakes. You want to create them with different sized rocks or cement blocks. Use Flat rocks, as they have higher surface area to volume ratio and heat up faster. Snakes demonstrate a preference for thin flat rocks. Use a wide range of thickness so that the structure will provide a range of temperatures. And as you can see here, this is a photo of a rock pile created along the edge of shrubs in an old field habitat, and it can provide an excellent basking sites for snakes. Species at risk snakes require primarily open and edge habitat for thermoregulation and foraging throughout the active season. As I have mentioned, habitat with little to no vegetative structure or complexity will generally be avoided by snakes. The addition of microhabitat features and vegetative structure is an extremely important component of the habitat creation process. So I have here a couple methods of maintaining open habitat. The first is manual vegetation removal. Selective logging and manual shrub removal to create a tr tree canopy opening for snakes. Create open habitats in or near areas that are known to be used by the target species. In areas of thick shrub cover, completely remove some shrubs and create brush piles from this material. You can also use fallen trees and uh, branch brush piles within or along the edges of clearings. Leave the stumps of all cut trees in place because they provide cover for snakes and rotting root systems may be used as hibernation sites. And as you can see here, um, there's a photo of a recently thinned pine plantation to restore oak savanna habitat with gaps that are suitable for eastern hognose snake. Shrub regrowth can result in significant shaders, shading after only a few years. The restoration of anthropogenic or degraded sites, um, you want to restore um, restoration of agricultural fields, cultural meadows, manicured lawns, and other areas with human land use to early successional habitat will benefit species at risk snakes as well as a wide range of biodiversity. Prescribed burns prevent fire adapted ecosystems from succeeding into more mature habitats like shrub thickets and forest. 
This can result in direct and indirect snake mortality. Uh, so great care must be taken when conducting prescribed burns to avoid or minimize their adverse effects to species at risk snakes. Follow all government rules and regulations. Do not burn in an area, the area immediately surrounding high vernacular gestation sites, nesting sites, or live birthing sites. Please use manual vegetation removal around these sensitive habitats. We want to ensure maintenance of some mature habitats and maintain habitat complexity and diversity. So it's re recommended to divide the site into burn and non-burn units and to only burn a subset of the burn units in any given year. Mowing controls the growth of woody vegetation and delays the natural su succession of meadows and for fields into forests, especially where prescribed burns are unsafe. So recent research involving radio tract snakes documented an unexpectedly high mortality of massasaugas during mowing, even when the mower blades were at a height of 20 centimeters. Due to the significant risk of this activity, mowing should be restricted to the hibernation period whenever possible. A few ways to minimize snake mortality are to use a hand mower, raise the mower blades as high as possible with a minimum height of 20 centimeters, mow on rainy days, cold and overcast days, or during other weather conditions when snakes are likely to be undercover. Move slowly through the snake habitat with a mower and when possible have someone walk a safe distance in front of the mower to watch for snakes and if it is safe, move them out of harm's way. Do not mow within the immediate area around habitat features that are known to be occupied at that time of year. So herbicide use is next. Uh, it has shown to negatively affect many reptile species as well as many snake prey species. Alternative techniques should take priority whenever feasible. The broad use, the broad scale use of herbicides such as aerial or machine-based application is not recommended. Herbicide application should be conducted only by a licensed applicator following all the appropriate health and safety measures and federal and provincial regulations. Habitat management activities that pose potential risk to species at risk, risk snakes or their habitat may require authorization under the ESA. Snakes can have home ranges that are up to several kilometers in length, depending on the species. Seasonal movements occur during spring and fall migration between hibernacula and summer habitat. Males travel long distances during the breeding period and move among key habitat features such as reproduction sites, basking sites, and shedding sites. Snakes also move through various thermal regulation and foraging habitats over the course of the season. Movement corridors include hedgerows, drains, ditches, and other vegetated linear features. Snakes will avoid moving through large areas that do not provide sufficient cover, and a couple of ideas to create movement habitat are to uh, make existing hedgerows wider, putting a hedgerow through the middle of a field or along the edge of your field, um, adding rocks along the edge of your hedgerows for snakes to bask and have cover from predators, allowing grasses to grow um, long can also pro provide cover to snakes. A buffer can be created around drainage dishes, ditches that native vegetation can be planted to grow, as well as placing rocks and logs in the buffer areas. Very limited information on the effectiveness of habitat creation and techniques in terms of use and long-term effects on local populations is known. Effectiveness monitoring can help to identify and find solutions for problems that may exist with ongoing management activities. More information is desperately needed so we can be sure people's time, money, and materials are having a benefit and so our designs can have maximum benefits to the snakes. Measuring success is very important because we want to make sure all our effort is making a difference for these species at risk snakes. To assess if our habitat management activities have been effective, it's necessary to determine whether the habitat is successfully being used for the intended life processes, for example, hibernation or gestation. And in some cases, how the habitat affects the fitness and or survival of the individual using it. So simply using the habitat does not determine if the habitat is functioning as intended. We also want to make sure that the structures that have been created don't turn into a long-term mortality sink. Um, for example, um, observations of snakes entering and using an artificially have created hibernaculum are not sufficient to assess the effectiveness of the habitat creation efforts because snakes that use the feature may not survive the winter. 
Isolated observations of snakes exiting an artificially created hibernaculum are also in inefficient to assess the effectiveness because the overall survival rate of the snakes using this structure would remain unknown. So you want to assess the survival of the snakes that use a hibernacula over years and compare those survival rates to typical survival rates for the local population. If the survival rate of snakes using created hibernacula is consistent with typical survival rates of the species, then the habitat efforts can be considered successful. If the survival rates are low, then the habitat should be modified in an attempt to increase survival or removed if likely to negatively affect the population. A success indicator of hibernacula is when the survival rate of snakes that use the artificially created hibernaculum are similar to or higher than the survival rates at other naturally occurring um, hibernacula. A success indicator for gestation sites is the evidence of gravid pregnant females using the site for gestation. Uh, for nest, a success indicator for nesting sites is the use of artificial nesting site by the target species and successful hatchling, hatching of at least some of the eggs. For birthing sites, a success indicator is the evidence that, that neonates, snake babies, have been born and at the created birthing site. The observation of two or more neonates at the site indicate that they're likely born in the immediate area. The observation of only a single neonate does not provide conclusive evidence of the use of the site for birthing, as the observed individual may have moved to the area from a nearby location. For communal and basking, communal basking and communal shedding sites, the success indicator is the use of the structure for the intended life process by two or more of the target species within the same active season. Indicator success for thermoregulation and foraging habitat is the increased use of the area by the target species after management actions have been completed. Increased use may be indicated by an increase in the number of individuals using the habitat or by the same number of individuals spending more time in the habitat than they did prior to management actions. Adaptive management is a process that involves monitoring the outcome of projects and using that information to improve existing projects as they progress and inform more effective future projects. Ecosystems and biological organisms, such as snakes, are complex and difficult to manage. Every project site is a unique situation with a complex combination of biotic and abiotic variables that can affect the success of habitat management activities. There is a great deal of uncertainty with respect to optimal techniques, techniques for creating species at risk snake habitat. Habitat creation projects should be treated as experiments with an adaptive management framework. Effectiveness monitoring is an integral part of this process because the data that are generated are used to test hypotheses about the habitat creation techniques. For example, they answer questions about what works well and what does not. An adaptive management process should never be used as an excuse for rush project design. Uh, habitat management activities should always be based on the best available information, including a thorough assessment of snake habitat use and spatial ecology at the site in question. And just to let you know, there is funding for snake habitat projects, um, such as the OSCIA's funding program uh, with the Species at Risk Farm and Center program. Uh, there's Conservation Authorities and Alice Alternative Land Use Services. And now I will pass it off to Mo uh, for the conclusion. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, Michelle. Just gonna go over some key takeaways um, before we wrap up here. Uh, so the take home messages of this presentation really are that there's a really useful new best management practices guide for how to identify, avoid harming, create and restore snake habitat. Um, currently it's not available online, but if you would like a copy, you can email info at blazingstar.ca, and you'll see that email address is at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and we're, we'd be happy to uh, send you a digital, digital copy. Um, so these practices are especially important because most of our species at risk snakes are disappearing from the landscape. In addition, they provide, these snakes provide many benefits to your farm. So if you want to create or improve snake habitat on your farm, as Michelle mentioned, there are really great funding opportunities, including soil and crops, uh, species at risk farm incentive program. Um, that's a great one to look into to start. 
So we really hope that you learned something today and that you're inspired to go out and protect uh, snakes on your property. Additionally, there will be an in-person training workshop held to teach uh, these best management practices um, at a future date. We don't know exactly when it will happen yet, but if you are interested in such a workshop, you can email training at glazingstar.ca. And so we can provide updates when we know more about when we're able to hold, hold the, this workshop. So this would be a, a workshop where you would actually go outdoors uh, and learn to identify snake habitat and then take part in creating and monitoring some snake habitat. So once again, if you're interested in that, um, email training at blazingstar.ca. And if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to email either of the email addresses mentioned today. So either info or training at blazingstar.ca and we'd be happy to answer any questions on the topics of either webinars. Additionally, both presentations will be posted on the Ontario Soil Crop Improvement Association website in the near future. Um, so if you did miss the first one, um, you can catch it there. The recording will be available on that website. So thank you once again for joining in and tuning in and hopefully you learned something and um, we've inspired you to help out our snakes in Ontario.